Good morning. Welcome to Florist United Methodist Church and our online worship with Florist Online and Restoration Worldwide. I'm Bob Riggles, one of the pastors on staff here. I'm joined this morning with Tom Berlin. We want to thank you for joining us wherever you are here locally in the Northern Virginia area or throughout the world. We're glad that you chose to spend these moments with us. I want to encourage you, if you have kids at home with you today, stay after the service and you'll find a Nearpod link where you can connect to our kids ministry opportunity. Kids Nation provides each week a lesson for preschoolers and for our grade school children, and we hope that you'll participate in that. Also, take a moment to let us know you're here. You can go online and register at floristumc.org here, or you can text here to Floris here to 31996. I want to let you know that beginning um, next week on July the 12th, we're going to be offering two different worship services. We're going to be offering a traditional service at 11 o'clock. The music will be traditional. Our band will be leading us at 915. The message will be the same at both services. But just be aware that that differentiated worship that many of you asked for in uh, the survey that we offered, that's going to be available to you next week. So again, it, just like before the pandemic, 915 will be our band, 11 o'clock, traditional music. And let me just say one other note. If you notice that there's a, a full choir singing, that's always footage from an archived pre-pandemic service. We are not using a full choir. I, I received a couple questions about that last week and just want to put your mind at rest. In fact, whenever we have singing, uh, we do that and we record it separately and then bring it in and edit into the service. We do that for everyone's safety that is working here to put this together. And just want to let you know about our safe practices. During this summer, our schedules have changed a lot due to the pandemic. That means that our student ministries hasn't been able to do their normal mission trips. What we are inviting you to do is you'll see a link in the bulletin. If you have an opportunity for our students to serve in the community, maybe it's yard work for someone that's in need of that special care or a, a construction job to help out a home that the people who are residing there don't have that opportunity, our students would like to mobilize for ministry this summer. So fill out an application. We'd like to put them into the uh, opportunity to serve you in our community here. This Tuesday, uh, July the 7th, from 7 to probably 8.30, Cynthia Lipensi is going to be leading a discussion on a group, on a Netflix movie. It's a documentary. It's called um, 13th. It talks about the history of the 13th Amendment and then all the things that have followed since then. Um, I hope you'll join. If you're interested in learning more um, history about race and racial justice in the United States, this is a great documentary. It, it talks about um, the, the difficulty of the, what has often been called the school to prison pipeline. Um, so I, I hope that you'll take a look at that um, documentary, watch it, and then join Cynthia on Tuesday. Um, and there's more information on our website. Excellent. Now, as we prepare to enter into worship, I know that some of you at home have been creating your own little special altars each week with candles or crosses. I know my family sets theirs up each week when we gather for worship. So we invite you, if you have the opportunity, to light a candle, to join us as we light these candles to invite the presence of Christ here into this space and into our homes May the Holy Spirit be present with us as we begin this morning of worship on this Independence Day weekend. And we will also start with a wonderful hymn of faith, America the Beautiful. And after we share in that hymn, I'll encourage you at home, wherever you are, we're going to have a recording of the Apostles' Creed. And we'd love for you to share along with that creed. It's a historic confession of faith that the world throughout uh, all of Christianity shares together, and it's the essential beliefs of who we are as followers of Jesus. Say 
believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thanks so much for sharing in the Apostles' Creed. I want to encourage you to take a few seconds now. Yoon's going to share on the piano, but go into your text box or maybe send somebody a message that you know. Let them know that you're here this morning, especially if you're a new visitor. Type in and let us know where you're watching from or, or where you've connected with us today. Amen. As we continue our worship this morning, we move into a time of prayer, a time where we're able to share and intercede on behalf of our congregants, our faith family, and those that we want to lift up in prayer. Maybe during this time, there's someone that's important to you, a family member, a neighbor that you would want to intercede or pray for. You'll see an opportunity to uh, share that prayer in the chat stream or online in the bulletin. But I'd like to lift up these names from our own congregation for you to pray for specifically today. Maybe write them down in your prayer journal and continue to pray for them throughout this week. We'd like to be praying for Jack Baker, who's Tanya Beach's father and continues in declining health. We also would like to continue to lift up Jim Allred and Susan Gonzalez as they continue the journey through treatment with uh, cancer, respectively. So we want to pray with and for them and their families. and and can commend them to our hearts this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Now, if you would join me, we'll have a few moments of silence, and then I'll share on this Fourth of July weekend in a prayer for our country and our community. Prince of Peace, Lord over every nation, you rule all the peoples of the earth. May you reign in our hearts as we gather to worship and pray. And even as we have created this space to meet virtually, we know that we still have the freedom and independence to worship you without threat or fear, harm or persecution. During this weekend where we celebrate freedom and liberation as a country, may we recognize and remember the sacrifices and challenges we witnessed in our nation's history and those we continue to experience as a people with the audacity suggests that all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. We are thankful for those who've stood for justice in our past, and we pray that we may continue this work in our nation and in our world. Inspire the minds of all women and men to whom you have committed the responsibility of government and leadership, that by their counsel, all nations and peoples may work together. We pray today specifically for our homeland, for our elected leaders, for those who continue to work towards a more perfect union, and for all U.S. citizens, as well as those from abroad who call the United States their home. We pray for those affected physically, financially, and emotionally as we continue to understand the way COVID-19 is affecting our families, our communities, and our society. We pray for small businesses and big corporations, public servants and healthcare employees, essential workers, furloughed staff, those who have lost their jobs or struggle to pay their bills. We pray for those who are sick and are in need of healing, for those who are feeling isolated and alone. As we continue through the summer and plan for the fall, we pray for our teachers and our educational staff, for our families and children, for those who are seeking belonging and connection in our faith community and beyond. And we pray also for the healing of our nation as we continue to persevere against the sickness of racism and inequity, a hurt and burden 
which is even more greatly illuminated by our current circumstances and more visible in the light of a historical lens which shows us equality for all in the eyes of humanity has and continues to be a long and difficult journey. Lord, remind us this day that we are all created in the image of God and that we may find true freedom and equality in Christ. In your mercy, hear us as we share the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Kelly Crespin, and I'm the Children's and Family Ministries Director here at Flores United Methodist Church. And today I wanted to talk to you about temptation. Now, temptation can be a kind of a big word, but basically temptation is something or someone causing you to feel like you should do something or you, you want to do something that you know you shouldn't do. Grown-ups experience temptation all the time. Kids do too. Whether you're the President of the United States or you're a baby learning to walk, we all experience temptation. The thought and the feeling that we want to do something that we know we're not supposed to do, and it's not a good decision. Sometimes temptation is easy to overcome, and other times it's harder. Let's say you're over at a friend's house and your friend says, let's play this video game. But when you look at the title, you know it's a video game that your mom and your dad has said you're not allowed to play for whatever reason. But your friend insists on playing that video game. What do you do? You can try using your words again, but if it doesn't happen and it doesn't work and your friend insists on playing, you have to be responsible and remove yourself from that temptation. Temptation is all around us, so we either have to remove ourselves from it or if we give in to that temptation, we have to suffer the consequences. Now, I want to show you a little experiment here today to show you what happens and how sin can suck you in. So this balloon here represents you. It represents you and you. It represents me. It represents all of us. And this vase represents the temptation. Now, what happens is you have something like fire. Fire you know you shouldn't touch. It kind of represents the, 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 the temptation that we all experience. And so what happens is the devil, someone, come and tempts you to, to do something you shouldn't do. And when that happens, you get sucked into that temptation. You can see what's happening here. That temptation just sucks you in. And what happens is the more you do things that you shouldn't do, maybe you play that video game and you don't get caught. So the next time you think, well, it wasn't that big of a deal. Nothing bad happened. I can do it again. That's the devil talking. So the only thing that can free this, in fact, you can see here that you can pick this up now and that you cannot release yourself from the temptation. And so the only thing that you can do is you can pray. It's the best thing that you can do. Even before you're sucked into that temptation, you should pray and ask God to help you not be tempted. And so if we have this straw and we say that this represents God, we can put this straw in here and we can release you from the temptation. Now I'm just going to set this right here. So you can see that how God can save you from that temptation but you have to be committed to praying and to asking God for that help. We all have to ask for help from sometimes. So thank you for listening today. I hope that you'll try over this next week to resist temptation, to do what you're supposed to do, to listen to your parents, and to listen to God. Thank you so much, and I will see you guys next week. Now's the time in our service when we celebrate generosity, and there are many ways to give to Florida United Methodist Church. You can give online. You can use the text message number that appears on the slide. 
Um, you can also, of course, give that old-fashioned way by a check. Um, and we are just very, very grateful for everything that, that uh, people give each week. Some of you use the Flores app, and that's another way to give. Um, so thank you for your generosity. Um, two things I wanted to highlight today. One is um, I was talking to Joe Apple, who's a member of our church. And Joe had some um, surgery and, and rehab time recently. And, and he and I, as we were talking, he said, Tom, is there any way you can thank everybody who's been sending me cards and encouraging me? You know, that encouragement really matters, and he is so grateful to those of you who have reached out and just, you know, checked on him and, and wanted to know how he was doing. So thank you for that. That's an act of generosity. That's an act of servanthood, and I just want to tell you it's noticed. And it's been noticed by others in the church who have been um, sick or who have been, you've reached out to as well. I uh, also want to tell you about our face mask ministry. Um, one of the groups that received um, the PPE, the personal protective equipment that are, you know, the face masks, the, the caps, and the gowns that we've got over 70 people in the church that are sewing these and putting these out each week. Um, Capital Caring Group, they sent a really nice thank you note to the church this past week. And in that, they said that um, they so appreciated the caps and the mask and other things that have been used. But they especially wanted to thank us because um, a number of their employees are from West Africa. And some of the fabric that was used um, was similar to the fabric I've seen in the markets in Sierra Leone and in West Africa as a whole. And they just said it was really special to them to be able to pick up a cap and, and use it that felt like home. So um, everybody who's been a part of that ministry, thank you so much. You're, you're really bringing safety and, and changing situations in that way. And it's been a big boost of encouragement to everybody who's received it. Take a moment now and give and just know we're really grateful for your generosity.
Our scripture reading this week is from the Gospel of Luke. It's the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 14. I encourage you to hear these words. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, Tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Then the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. But Jesus answered, It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil then led Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Since it is Independence Day weekend, Tom and some of our volunteers were able to take the time to go out and prepare this special message for you. I just love the National Mall. I grew up about 75 miles from here, and I remember as a child, my parents would take the three boys, throw them in the back seat, and we'd drive down here. Uh, We'd go to see one of the Smithsonian Museums in the morning, and then my dad would go grab my mom's red picnic basket, and we'd carry that out, and we'd come under the shade of the trees. We'd have lunch, we'd run around, we'd see the people and watch everything, and then we'd um, go into another museum in the afternoon. And it was just a great day. I've always loved coming down here and walking around and seeing the museums. I thought this would be the perfect place to go today on Independence Day weekend. Um, We're in a sermon series called History Has Its Eyes on You with the release of Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. This July 4th weekend, I want you to think about what's here on the National Mall, and I want you to think about our second baptismal question. We did the first one last week. The second question is this. Will you use the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression? And I would argue that in our national story and in our personal stories, Everything rises or falls on the answer to that one question, event by event by event. You see the Washington Memorial behind me. It's 555 feet tall, tallest structure in Washington outside of a radio tower. It it is the memorial to General George Washington, the man who took a ragtag army of volunteers and he beat the largest and most powerful military force in Europe in his day. He then became President George Washington. He served well. And just in the moment when uh, people were wondering if he was going to stay on and become a king in America, he steps down and he steps out of power. And he shows how power in a democracy will transfer based not on the will of the ruler, but on the will of the people and the vote that they exercise. Truly, he was a, a great man. But there's also this other side to George Washington that is important. You know, we, we mythologize these people, these leaders. We mythologize our own history. We say, oh, George Washington never told a lie. And, and it's just not true. He's human, just like you and me. And he's dealing with this question of his freedom about injustice, oppression, evil. Karen and I watched a documentary on George Washington. And in it, we saw that he and his wife, Martha, which I knew, owned over 300 enslaved persons. That's what created their wealth at Mount Vernon. What I didn't know is the tremendous pains he took to retain each one of those enslaved people. 
When the Capitol was in Philadelphia, for example, uh, there was a law that Pennsylvania had founded by Quakers who didn't believe in slavery. And the law was this, if you had an enslaved person in Philadelphia for more than six months, they became free. And so Washington made sure, and he kept a diary, he rotated his enslaved servants out taking them over to New Jersey and then coming back, taking them back to Virginia, then coming back, because every time he took them out of Philadelphia and came back, he restarted the clock and made sure that they lost their chance for freedom. You may have heard that Washington had false teeth. Some of us have been told that those teeth were made of wood. They weren't. They were made, in fact, the last pair of the teeth of his enslaved servants. One by one, those teeth were extracted from living human beings and put into the dentures that then went into Washington's mouth. Now, you may say, listen, Washington was a product of his time, Tom. He, Washington couldn't help that. I mean, it was the economy of the time. It was how things were done. People hardly even knew it was wrong. But that's not true. Washington had a secretary during the Revolutionary War. His name was Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton later went on to become his secretary of the Treasury. The two men worked together very closely. And while Washington was dealing with all this, Hamilton was in New York creating the New York Manumission Society. That society was instrumental in New York as a state abolishing slavery. Two men, one question. We accept the freedom and the power to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, and two radically different conclusions. Both men attend church, both men read the scriptures, but two different outcomes. And you see, part of the problem with evil, injustice, and oppression is there's so much a part of the fabric of our lives that sometimes we don't even see them as evil, injustice, and oppression. And what Jesus shows us in Luke 4 is that we have to see it clearly to reject it. So you know that story. It was just read. Um, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. He's exhausted. He hasn't been eating. He's been fasting. He's been praying. And that's when the tempter shows up. And the tempter says, you know, if you're hungry, you can turn these stones into bread. And Jesus rejects that. He says, you know what? I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that flows from the mouth of God. He rejects the short-term gain for the long-term virtue, the long-term trust in God. Quickly, the evil one takes him up to the highest pinnacle in Jerusalem. It would be like taking him to the pinnacle of the Washington Monument in D.C. He says, throw yourself off. The angels will catch you. And this is an appeal. The first one was to hedonism. The second one is to egoism. Egoism is the thought that if I do it, there won't be consequences. I'm special. I'm different. It's a different standard for me. And Jesus refuses to throw himself off. He says, you don't put God to the test. Very quickly, the evil one takes him up to a broad mountain vista overlooking cities and civilizations and says, I'll give you everything. I'll give you the, the power. I'll give you the wealth. I'll give you the adulation of these people if you'll just worship me. And this is the temptation to power and to materialism. And Jesus quickly says, no, he rejects evil, injustice, and oppression. But he, do you see that the ability to reject is predicated on the ability to see what's right in front of you and to call it evil, to call it a temptation, to call it something that must be resisted. And God gives us the freedom and the power to both see it and reject it. Now, if Jesus accepts any one of these temptations, you and I never have the offer of salvation that comes to us in his suffering, servant-oriented death on the cross. Likewise, when we fail to reject evil, injustice, and oppression, we change our personal stories. We change our community story, and we even change our national story. Let me show you another example. One of the things I love about the National Mall is it tells the story of the great accomplishments of America. It talks about the, the science and the discoveries. It talks about the, the development of our democracy. It, it talks about uh, the arts and, and what Americans have done there. We can go place after place, the Air and Space Museum, to, to just see the great explorations that we've made. And, and at the same time, it attempts, I think, especially in recent years, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. One of the ways that's happened over the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years, is the addition of the Native American Museum on the south side of the mall and the African American Museum on the north side of the mall. 
These two museums celebrate the unique accomplishments of those populations in our country. But they also tell the story of evil, injustice, and oppression. They show how some people have been marginalized by the larger population. And they attempt to do that through facts. And it's really important to have that whole story told or the memorials will become myth. The, the people that we see, rather than celebrating their great leadership, but also having the ability to look at, at where they failed, where they didn't get it right every single time, where they're just like you and me. That'll get lost if we don't have the whole story. A great example is behind me, the Lincoln Memorial. Walk up those steps and look at the face of Lincoln. I know you've done that. On the one hand, I see a man who's strong, a man who's a, a person that lived on the frontier and had to, to you know, cut logs and build houses. But on the other hand, I see a man who's worn out. I see a man who's carrying the burden of the war, the, the Civil War where thousands and thousands of men are dying. Because the one thing that Lincoln is trying to do is to save the Union. He's trying to keep that together. And to do that, he's having to make some compromises. And those compromises are not inconsequential. Um, the biggest compromise is what he did with slavery. Lincoln, in August of 1862, makes a remarkable statement about what he's really trying to accomplish, which is to save the Union. He says, if I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do that. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I'd do that. What's he saying? He's saying that evil, that injustice, and that oppression, that's not my primary goal. My primary goal is to save the Union. And part of what facing evil, injustice, and oppression does is it helps us look at our life and realize the complexity of moral choices, the difficulty of it. And we have to accept that when we don't pursue the resistance to evil, injustice, and oppression, history has its eyes on us. And, and we have to think about that and do our, our level best. I actually think that Lincoln may be a good example of trying to do this well over the course of time. You know, Frederick Douglass was uh, someone who visited Lincoln three times in the White House. Uh, an African-American leader, uh, a publisher, uh, in many ways uh, a statesman. Um, Frederick Douglass meets with him and talks about whether uh, Black people will see, receive the same wages in the Army, whether they can actually serve in the Army, whether they can actually serve in the front lines and not just serve as cooks and servants. And so Douglas has a lot at stake in this because he's trying to lead his people to freedom. When, after the war is over and, and after Lincoln is gone, there is the Emancipation Monument Memorial, which is up on Capitol Hill. When that's unveiled, he gives a sort of a a difficult review of Abraham Lincoln. During that, he, he basically says, Abraham Lincoln was not the president of black people. Douglas says, he was ready and willing at any time during his first years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights and humanity of colored people to promote the welfare of white people in this country. Now just think about that for a second. That sounds kind of harsh. Now, by the end of the speech, Douglas goes on to say, despite all that, Providence used Abraham Lincoln to set us free. And he was grateful for that. But again, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. He has to acknowledge a complicated thing that Lincoln was trying to do, save the Union, but then later also become the man who not only gives the Emancipation Proclamation during the war, setting some enslaved people free, but also passing the 13th Amendment, which guaranteed the freedom of all. One way that we don't reject evil, injustice, and oppression is we put it off. We say, you know what, that's not expedient right now. That's not the thing I can do right now. That's not something I'm comfortable with right now. Have you ever done that? Have you ever not spoken up about something that was obviously wrong? Have you ever not acted when you felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to act? I think Lincoln is a Christian, a man whose faith in God pushed him to act 
when he had been putting off acting. And that made all the difference in his legacy. When you're trying to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, one thing that really helps is to have someone to help you, someone to be a conscience, someone to give you some accountability. And I think that's one of the things that helped Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was married to Eleanor Roosevelt, and the two of them were a pretty powerful combination. Uh, FDR enters his office as president in a time of national crisis. The economy is in a deep depression, and there's a lot of suffering as a result. In fact, he works for four years, and in his second inaugural address, he shares this quote, I see one third of a nation ill-housed, ill-clad, and ill-nourished. But it is not in despair that I paint you that picture. I paint it for you in hope, because the nation, seeing and understanding the injustice in it, proposes to paint it out. We are determined to make every American citizen the subject of this country's interest and concern and we will never regard any faithful law-abiding group within our borders as superfluous. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Now that strong call to economic justice came from FDR, but it also came from his wife, Eleanor. Their Christian faith pushed them to address the ills of the nation with great diligence. And so FDR launched a, a, a battery of legislation that is collectively called the New Deal. Now at the same time, there were other problems in America. One of those was lynching. In the 1930s, African American people were being terrorized by groups of, of white people who showed up and would with off, often very little cause or provocation and certainly no trial, take a person and execute them by lynching. And if you're an African-American person, you know the deep history of lynching that was not just in the South, but also in places in the North as well. There was anti-lynching legislation that was proposed in this time. FDR at first said he was for it. He supported it. His wife certainly supported it. But then there was some New Deal legislation that FDR realized unless he released the anti-lynching legislation, he wasn't going to have the votes on the New Deal legislation. And that's what he did. Eleanor was left deeply disappointed because she was a woman who saw evil, injustice, and oppression with tremendous clarity. An example of that is when the Daughters of the American Revolution had <clears throat> scheduled Marian Anderson, um, arguably the best soprano of her day, to sing at the DAR Constitutional Hall, very close to the National Mall. They rejected her. They told her she couldn't come and sing. They didn't want to have any sort of an integrated performance. When Eleanor Roosevelt heard about that, she rescinded her membership to the DAR. And then she began to work with Marian Anderson and with others. And together they found Miss Anderson a new venue, the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. She didn't just play to a few thousand, sing to it for a few thousand at the Constitution Hall. She sang on Easter morning. Over 75,000 people gathered. It was a remarkable performance. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is a great president. He helped lead the country with Congress out of a deep depression. He, with Churchill, led the nation as they together brought their countries to fight um, fascism in Europe. And they overcame the Nazi threat that was a global threat. And so there is much to celebrate about FDR. It's appropriate that there's a memorial here to him. That's history we need to know. But at the same time, we need to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the truth is, FDR was a flawed human being just like you and me. We have to look at the facts of history. This man who once said, you have nothing to fear but fear itself, he caved to fear at different times to get legislation passed. Probably the worst example of this is what happened to over 117,000 American citizens of Japanese descent at the height of World War II, when there was great fear after Pearl Harbor that the Japanese were about to invade California, FDR allowed all of those persons to be rounded up, and he put them in concentration camps for the duration of the war. That was an injustice that later President Ronald Reagan spoke to as he offered some economic reparations to those families. And it was a time when we can see how fear gets in the way of rejecting 
evil, injustice, and oppression, fear, when we experience it, is what keeps us from accepting the power and the freedom that God gives us to do that work. I wonder, is there anything in your life that you fear? I have to look at the fears that I carry. Some of those fears even keep me from examining where I'm not standing up to evil, injustice, and oppression. And that's an important lesson when you come to the FDR Memorial. When you resist evil, injustice, and oppression, you, you have to think not just about avoiding the negative, but doing the positive. In other words, you have to think about how to, to do justice, how to, how to live out righteousness. You, you, you have to think about how do you make a change in the society or in the personal situation that you're in. In 1955, a young Baptist pastor breaks into the national scene leading a bus boycott. He's starting what we now call the Civil Rights Movement. His name is Martin Luther King, and he is here behind me. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of our country's great leaders because of what he did during the Civil Rights era. He introduced a new form of protest called nonviolent protest. He taught his um, followers, he said, listen, when we march and people hit us or hurt us, we're not going to resist. And he created a tremendous contrast. While his protesters were nonviolent, the people coming at them with sticks, water cannons, even murderous mobs who from time to time actually murdered followers of the civil rights movement. Whenever that happened, they didn't push back. They didn't hit back. And soon the nation could see the, the contrast. The, the nation could see who was resisting evil, injustice, and oppression and who was creating evil, injustice, and oppression. And it seared the national conscience. People began to look at the images on the TV set and say, you know, something's definitely wrong here. Martin Luther King was uh, threatened. He was, uh, his house was um, always at, at risk. His children, his family were at risk. And he was thrown in jail on more than one occasion. On one of those occasions, um, a, a group of clergy, in fact, some Methodist clergy were in the group that sent the letter, told King, you know, we, we agree with what you're doing, but we think it's unwise and untimely to do it at this time. King wrote what we now call the letter from the Birmingham jail. It's one of his most famous pieces. It's something you might think about reading on this July 4th weekend. And, and in it, he says to these pastors, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We're tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. That type of an eloquent statement about evil, injustice, and oppression is why King in 1963 is on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and he offers his most famous speech, I Have a Dream. Almost a year later, on July 2nd, 1964, President Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act. It's the most sweeping civil rights legislation since uh, the time after the Civil War. It, integrates public schools. It says that public places like parks and restroom facilities offered to the general public are open to everyone. It says that you can't discriminate in employment situations based on race and other factors. That would have never happened except that people joined that nonviolent protest. People marched. People came out in the public square. People spoke up and it was common people. And there's a contrast. When Lincoln was thinking about ending slavery, one of the reasons he couldn't do it is that the average citizen, almost all of whom were Christians, was against freeing enslaved people. That was the reality that Lincoln had to deal with in his political calculations. King, by this time, has a different calculation. He realizes the best of America can now be called forth because when people see the injustice, they're going to rise up against it. King and those who work with him they all took that risk of, of deciding whether America would be a country of grace and love, generosity, and, and, and by contrast, if America was going to stick to racism, to fear, and to cruelty. That was the bet they made in an era of dramatic change. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King lost his life because of that battle. He was assassinated. 
And he's memorialized here because in the words of his great biographer, Taylor Branch, he is considered a new founding father. He is on the order and magnitude of people like George Washington or later great Americans like Abraham Lincoln. King taught us not the, the worst that we could be. He taught us the best that we could be. He called out what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And that's a big piece of accepting the freedom and power to resist evil, injustice, and oppression. And that's what you and I have to think about today. Evil, injustice, and oppression are always at work every generation, every decade, every year. That's why it's so important for citizens to do the work. That's why it's so important for leaders to do the work. And to think about how do we resist that? It's, it's important on an Independence Day celebration to, to think this through, to think about the state of our country and to compare it to the original documents. What would it be if you would open up the Declaration of Independence and read it, or the Constitution and read it? I'll tell you, you're going to find a, a beautiful set of aspirations there for a nation, for a democracy. You're going to find beautiful words which illuminate the pathway to freedom that all of us want to walk and pursue. But you're also going to find that the beauty of those words exposes the ugliness of our society where the, ever there are places of inequity and injustice. In fact, the more you read those words, the more motivated you will become to want to deal and address with those inequities and those injustices. Abraham Lincoln told us that. He was standing in Gettysburg months after a great battle of the Civil War, over 23,000 casualties. Imagine the carnage of Gettysburg, if you've ever looked at those historical uh, prints that, that show the photographs of the carnage of that battlefield. And in that moment, in that address, Lincoln says something really important. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, Lincoln calls us to consider the unfinished work of our democracy. The unfinished work that leads to that new birth of freedom. He, he didn't mean it just at that moment. I think Lincoln understood that at every generation of America, that was always the work. And it goes hand in hand with this concept of accepting the freedom and the power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression. We have to start there. And so we do the work of citizens. We vote, and we take the vote seriously and understand what a gift it is to live in a society where you actually get to vote. And we don't say, I'm too busy, or I just didn't know what to do. We educate ourselves, we learn, and we advocate, we act. We think about our nation and our country. We, we call our leaders on Capitol Hill and we share our opinions with them. We stand against what is contrary to the will of Christ. We stand for what is right and righteous. That's always been the work of what it means to be a good Christian, and a good American. And that freedom that's offered to us, it's not just for me. It's for me and for my neighbor. It's for me and citizens all over the United States. And so I pray that God will bless you to do the work to think about, are you resisting evil, injustice, and oppression? And God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. I pray it will always be the land of the free and the home of people brave enough to do the work to think about the good they stand for and the evil they stand against.
I pray all God's blessings on you for a wonderful holiday weekend and for the week to come. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Parents, I hope you'll take time and open up Nearpod and uh, make that a part of your child's day today.